Hello, it's Matt Drapper here. My pronouns are he and him. You might know me from spilling the tea on evangelical Christianity, campaigning about conversion therapy, or from live tweeting television. If you follow me on Twitter, you'll know I can switch from the theological criticism of biblical literalism to live tweeting RuPaul's Drag Race UK with literally no warning. I'm grateful to be invited to share stories with you. I will be talking about finding God in exclusion. I was excluded. Exclusion exists wherever there is an acceptable in-group and an unacceptable out-group. Being excluded can be painful, whether it means being excluded from a friend group or an organisation such as a church or a charity or being excluded from access to funds or privileges afforded to those who are in-group but not to those who are out-group. Women are often excluded from the narrative. Exclusion can be intentional. Exclusion operates as a message to those in-group that you could easily become out-group, so stay in line. Other times, exclusion may be unintentional or caused by a lack of intention. For example, overlooking those who do not look like you or behave like you. As a child, you may experience exclusion from other kids in the playground and that feeling of isolation stays with you. I'm sure we can all think of a time we have been excluded. Some churches or religious groups exclude and this can be particularly dangerous because churches act as the gatekeeper of access to God. I will begin with a story from the Western biblical texts about a woman who found God in the literal desert. Then I'll explain a little about my story so far and then share insights from the practices of excluded African queer refugee Christians in reclaiming Bible stories for themselves, which is something that we can do at the gathering. This is a discussion group, so I do not want to come for a position of definitive explanation. My own understanding of the Bible has changed a great deal over time. When I was young, I followed the more modern concept that every passage is the exact historical accurate storytelling. A couple of years ago, I did a Halloween series exploring the grossest, grimmest, most jarring and disgusting Bible texts, which vastly changed how I interact with the Bible. These days, I read it with more interest in why the stories are written down and how they resonate with humanity and our search for God. Whether historical fact or story told and retold, the characters and situations in the Bible tell us about human existence. Take the story of Hagar. Many stories of women in the Bible are traditionally told from the perspectives of the men who marry them, own them, abuse them, or are born of them. Women are the side characters in a male story. However, if you read Genesis from the perspective of the women, there is a wealth of awesome stories. The saying, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, has so many interesting connotations when you switch it to the God of Sarah, Rebecca, Leah and Rachel. Hagar exists in Jewish, Muslim and Christian history and theology. Some tellings of her story present her as the daughter of Pharaoh and as a princess, while the traditional Christian text only refers to her as the handmaid of the main characters, Abraham and Sarah in Genesis 16 and 19. Now Abraham is the patriarch of modern religion. He is the great, 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 great granddad of Jesus. He and his wife Sarah believed that God had promised that they would give them a son for the male inheritance and to become a great nation. But both were already growing older with no proof of this promise. Attempting to fulfil the inheritance in her own way, Sarah gave Abraham her servant Hagar to carry his child. When it was discovered that Hagar is pregnant, Sarah got jealous and mistreated Hagar. Unable to remain under the bullying and mistreatment, 
she ran away into the desert. At this stage, Hagar can be seen as a survivor of abuse, pushed out of the household where she was previously drawn into the very centre, excluded. In the desert, Hagar is met by God, who asks who she is and why she is there. She tells her story and God says, the Lord has heard of your misery. In a moment of connection with God, Hagar finally feels seen and understood. And she does something absolutely radical for a woman in the Bible. She names God. She calls God El Roy, the God who sees me. God sees who she is and affirms her dignity and in turn she sees God and names God El Roy. And this is the only time you'll find God referred to as El Roy in the Bible. It's a deeply personal. God tells Hagar to go back to Sarah and with the strength of God's approval she returns to Abraham and Sarah and has her child Ishmael. However, this is not the end of her story. Later, Sarah has a child of her own, Isaac, who becomes the great, 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 one less great than Abraham, grandfather of Jesus. Now that she has her own descendant, when Sarah sees Ishmael and Hagar, she can't stand the sight of them and has Abraham send them away. Abraham takes Hagar and her son and leaves them in the desert with just a bottle of water. When the water has run out and her child is sick with thirst, Hagar cannot watch him in pain any more. They have both been excluded this time, very literally thrown out into the desert. Unable to even look at the pain of her son, Hagar lays him under a bush and hides her face. Once again, God hears the pain of her exclusion and of her physical need and comes to her guiding her to water and promises her, you will become a great nation, separate from Abraham and Sarah. So what has Hagar to do with LGBTQIA plus lives today? Well, let's look at the script again. Her story raises many discussion points. Hagar can be read as an outsider in the household of Abraham and Sarah. She can be read as a survivor. Her existence in the narrative has the potential to make Abraham and Sarah look bad. Is this why she is rarely given the focus? When you look at this story, which character do you identify with? Abraham and Sarah were holding on to a promise full of uncertainty about how God's promise to them would be fulfilled. In order to try and deal with their fear of the unknown, they took advantage of others. But later, when they found a future for themselves, were quick to throw the same others under the bus. There is a lot here which reminds me of the fear of LGBTQIA plus people in some Christian leaders. There's many parallels in the treatment of Hagar and the treatment of queer people in the church. Being at the gathering, for me, feels like coming home. I was working with students at a church in Sheffield for a while, but ended up on a similar journey to Hagar from insider to outsider. I was born to Christian parents and had 10 brothers and sisters. We read the Bible through cover to cover every year. I was told in subtle and in not so subtle messaging that my identity meant I would be excluded from the church and access to God if I were to ever come out and lead a gay lifestyle. I was in my 20s when I eventually came out and I did lose access to my family. Around the same time, I joined a hip, very cool, very young adult focused church in Sheffield. They became family to me. Initially, I was welcome and even seen as a special gay Christian experiment. I agreed to be gay but celibate and was told we would figure out what God was saying to the church about gay people together. But it was inside this church space I was ultimately put through an anti-gay exorcism experience. I don't want to go into the whole thing, but it left me feeling 
outside my own body even, certainly alienated from the rest of the church. There's more about this in my book, Bringing Me Back to Me. Despite this opposition and the othering of the church, I still found myself deeply in love with the concept of Jesus as the one who sees me. I had never hidden my thoughts from Jesus. Psalm 139 says, You have searched me, Lord, and you know me. To me, Jesus had seen me in every moment of my life and had never stopped saying, I love you as you are. But it took me a long time to hear it, though more and more I had a feeling that Jesus recognised my pain. And it was through my existence as an outsider and my confidence in Jesus, I was able to re-study the Bible and understand it as an inclusive, not exclusive, text. Not unlike Hagar returning to Abraham and Sarah, against her better judgment, I tried to stick with my newfound family, the church, in my role as a student leader, with a view to share the understanding of God I had found. After all, we were figuring out what God was saying together, right? However, the more I spoke about God as an inclusive force, the more I was pushed out until eventually top leaders sat me down and outright told me I was dangerous to be around students and young adults in the church as I might lead them into the gay lifestyle. Living openly in my identity and my truth led to my being excluded and in the desert. I was not only thirsty myself, but I was witness to the pain of other LGBTQIA and neurodivergent people who were not given safe access to the church. While I struggled to exist in that space, others have taken a different approach. Kenyan LGBTQIA Christians and queer Ugandan refugees have been excluded, not just from mainstream Christianity in their countries, but from the Western narrative of where Christianity is at right now. But actually, from a position of exclusion, they have been re-scripting Bible stories into their stories and seeing the God who sees them. A recent inspiration to me has come from Adrian Van Klinken, Professor of Religion and African Studies at the University of Leeds and co-author of Reimagining Christianity and Sexual Diversity in Africa. In his inaugural lecture in October 2021, he talked about the theological practice of LGBTI refugees in Kenya, including refugees escaping from the recent anti-homosexuality bill in Uganda. Adrian and the network of queer refugees in Kenya called the Nature Network worked together on a project of retelling Bible stories from an LGBT QIA refugee perspective. And it became a moving and enriching piece of research which was published as Sacred Queer Stories. Adrian says, one of the secrets of African queer existence is joy and creativity, and the joy of being creative. As one contributor explained, in this project, we creatively use stories from the Bible to tell our own life experiences as LGBTI refugees. The Bible is often used against us, but in this project, we reclaim it as a book that affirms and empowers us. For example, they used the story of Daniel in the lion's den as a play about being arrested under the anti-homosexuality bill in Uganda and miraculously freed from prison to great celebration. Another contributor to Sacred Queer Stories states, The Bible is a book of life and we should use it to reveal our lives. These fresh streams have reminded me of God's message to Hagar you will become a great nation. Not dependent on the organisation, but as yourself. Finding God in exclusion may involve a process of seeing yourself and naming God. When I look at the story of Hagar, I see many elements which speak to a queer narrative. And 
her story can be queered into methods of telling our own stories. Thank you.